Well, we should definitely pray uh, as we look at God's Word here. We should always do that. And I guess this morning, with things being a bit funny, we will especially do so. <laughs> Father, we thank you that we can meet. Thank you that we can hear from your Word. And we ask that you'll be with us this day, that you'll be guiding us by your Spirit, that you're helping us be learning wisdom and learning about the fear of the Lord. Help me speak what is true and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wisdom. I wonder what wisdom actually is. We, 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 we've titled this series Wisdom from Proverbs, where we're obviously going to be looking at this book of Proverbs uh, throughout term three and be thinking about what is the wise way of living? What does it actually look like to live a life of wisdom? And so I wonder if you're trying to think, uh, uh, what are the models of wisdom that you can think of? If you're trying to think, who is the wise person? What sort of person comes to your mind? I wonder if the first place we turned to was trying to think, who is the smartest person we know? Who is the person with the highest IQ we can think of? Are they the model of wisdom? Uh, it used to be, it's, it's not anymore because I think he died in 2018, but it used to be the default answer is who is the smartest person in the world for about a generation? We just said this guy, Stephen Hawking, uh, up there. You can kind of see him in the, in the blurred picture out there. Is that who we think of? We think, is he the model of wisdom? Is it about someone like him who is the, the smartest of the smart people? Is that what wisdom is all about? Or maybe wisdom is something a little bit different to that. Maybe it's not just about the highest IQ you can imagine. Uh, but maybe it's something like this guy. Now, I'm assuming not many know who this is. Does anyone know who this guy is? Who this actor is? Anyone? There's a smirk here. You've seen this show. Uh, there's a show, I think it's on Netflix or something like that. It's called The Good Place. I'm not necessarily endorsing the show, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a Hollywood version of heaven. It's about these people who who turn up in the good place, uh, but unfortunately a few of the people there don't think they should be in the good place, so it's quite a comical thing. Anyway, Chidi is one of the, 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 the main characters in it, and Chidi was an ethics professor, and so he's constantly talking about philosophy, and he's this sort of guru who knows just about everything that any wise person has ever said, and can try and interpret it for you. He kind of gets stuck in a loop sometimes, because he's always trying to think through what the ethics of every situation is. But is it the professor? Is it this sort of guru figure who can talk about any philosophical view you can imagine? Is that what we're meant to think of when we think of wisdom? Option three that I'm going to put on the screen is going to seem a little bit left field. Is wisdom this fella, Usain Bolt? Uh, now, some of you may remember this, but uh, when Usain Bolt won his third straight Olympic 100 metre uh, men's gold medal, at, I think it was 2016, it would have been Rio, and Bruce McAvaney's commentary. Uh, we miss hearing Bruce in commentary all the time. And Bruce, as, as you say, is starting to, because he was a little bit behind in the start of the race, and then he flew past them all, as he always did, uh, and still won by a couple of metres. And Bruce's commentary was, Usain's going to do it. He's a genius. He's a genius. Which, which made me at the time think, is it really a genius thing to be able to run in a straight line really fast? Um, I'm not sure, but is he what we're meant to think of when we think of what wisdom looks like? Should it be the person with the highest IQ? Should it be the person who can talk about all these philosophical things? Or should it be someone who can just run, well, not just really fast, faster than anyone else has ever run? But we're going to try and answer that question in a few moments' time as we begin this series in the book of Proverbs. And we're going to try and keep it relatively simple this morning and try and think about, well, what actually are Proverbs? Ooh, that was a bit interesting, wasn't it? I apologise for everyone whose ears are going to blow up multiple times this morning. We'll, we'll try not to let that happen too often. Lynn's now suggesting I move on to microphone number three. This one. This one. It won't do the crackling. Okay. Hopefully, Marcus is going to make it get longer for me, hopefully. Yes, I think so. How are we going? All right, wisdom. 
We're going to need some wisdom with how to use tech. Um, we had a conversation this morning at our parish council. We probably need to spend some money on upgrading the tech. This is a, like a living demonstration of why we probably need to spend some money on upgrading the tech. Uh, anyway, uh, what are the Proverbs? What actually are Proverbs and how do we get our heads around them? And then what is, this, what is wisdom and what is the fear of the Lord, as we heard in that reading from God just before? Uh, so to jump right in there, what actually is a proverb? Uh, we use uh, the English expression proverb. Uh, typically in, in English, it's talking about a, a short and catchy saying that the mass population agree with. We all think it's this sort of common wisdom, don't we? We think things like better late than never or no use crying over spilt milk. Uh, we have all these expressions. You can, you've probably got hundreds of them that you can easily call to mind. There are these short, catchy sayings that are, that are, that are, that are popularly believed. Uh, and the, the Bible's version of Proverbs is similar, but there are some differences. Uh, one of the basic differences is that they're not necessarily popular, what they say. They're often short, they're often catchy, but they don't necessarily say things that people want to hear. Uh, one of the first of the sort of traditional Proverbs is Proverbs 10, verse 2. Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. It's basically saying when the wicked people or when evil people or people who are following God, if, if, if they get lots of money through some form of deception, it's not going to last. That's not a popular proverb because it's basically telling a whole heap of people the money you have won't last forever. But... And, and, but it is a, a proverb in, in, in the Bible. So proverbs in the Bible, they are typically poetic. Uh, they come from Hebrew poetry. Like most forms of poetry, Hebrew poetry is, is trying to use the fewest possible words to make the biggest possible point. Uh, poetry lacks the nuance of prose. In prose, you can write sentence after sentence and you'll include all those little all those little conjunctions, all those little tiny words that explain what, or the relationship between sentences. And then you can use paragraphs and then you can use pages and chapters and so on. In poetry, you're trying to be as efficient as possible. Poetry is about efficiency of language, but also about extracting as much a possible emotional response to the limited language you use. And so proverbs tend to be quite provocative in what they say. They can be quite shocking at times in what they say. Uh, we'll look at this in more detail as we get start actually reading through uh, bulk amounts of Proverbs, but uh, Hebrew poetry, the other thing that I imagine many of you have heard before is that it tends to operate using this idea of parallelism. Uh, so English poetry is all about rhyming words and meter. That's not a thing in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew poetry does not sound pretty. Uh, but, but Hebrew poetry is usually about two lines of poetry, line A and line B, where they have some sort of relationship with each other. Maybe the line B is maybe contrasting line A, or maybe it's affirming, expanding upon line A, or, 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 or it, it, that's what's going on. There are these two, two parallel thoughts. Uh, so one uh, simple one I thought, a good farming uh, proverb that appears in, in, in here. It's the wrong season for it, but we'll go with it anyway. Uh, Proverbs 10, verse 5. He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son. But the contrasting thought, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. You can see how kind of the, the two lines relate with one another. That's a typical type of proverb. It's self-contained, it's just those two lines tell you everything you need to know about what it's trying to say. But one of the big questions as you're reading through Proverbs uh, is, do Proverbs always come true? Can you just flick through the book of Proverbs, find, find one off and claim it and say, this must always in all circumstances be the case? Now that's a big topic, uh, but... I guess I want to alert us as we're reading through it to a couple of ideas. Uh, the first one is fairly simple. Uh, if we apply our mind to reading Proverbs properly, context is king. It is wrong to say that every proverb is always true all of the time. 
Proverbs are written addressing a certain context and a certain situation, and, and in that context it may be true, but it may not actually work in other areas. And we actually know this from our English proverbs too. We know that they, they apply in different circumstances. Uh, the classic one, which isn't necessarily about the kitchen, but let's keep it to the kitchen in how we try and understand it, is the proverb, too many cooks spoil the broth. What's too many cooks spoil the broth trying to get at? It, it, it's trying to get at that when you're cooking a, a broth, a, a soup, some sort of saucy dish with flavour, you can't have every man and his dog in the kitchen there adding their own ingredients to it because it just won't work. If everyone's just throwing this in and throwing that in and throwing this in and throwing that in, it, it'll lose its flavour. It won't have this, 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 this nicely developed flavour that you're looking for. Too many cooks will spoil the broth. And yet we have this other proverb, don't we? Many hands make light work. And that proverb particularly appeals to after the meal. When, it, when many hands jump in, grab up all the dishes and start washing up. And we say, that works. But if many hands are there in the broth, it'll spoil the broth. But if only one person's doing washing up, washing up takes a long time. So we actually understand that even in our English context, proverbs are about the situation you're trying to apply them in. But you also need to understand Proverbs in the context of the Bible itself. Because Proverbs is one of the books of wisdom in the Old Testament. There are, there are three main books of wisdom. There's Proverbs, there's the book of Job, and the book of Ecclesiastes. There's also some wisdom psalms too that, that are worth noting as well. And so you, 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 you need to understand those three books in relationship to one another. Because Proverbs, generally speaking, will teach us that if you are righteous, things will go well for you in life. If you work hard, you will acquire wealth. If you are honest, things will go well for you. If you are dishonest, if you are foolish, if you are lazy, if you are these things, things won't go well. But then Job and Ecclesiastes kind of give us the flip side. Uh, I'm assuming most of us know the story of Job well enough to know that Job is, is this story about this, this righteous man who suffers terribly. And despite the accusations of his three so-called friends and their younger companion, Job is not actually at fault for his pain. He doesn't have this sin that he needs to repent of, yet he suffers a great deal. Likewise, the book of Ecclesiastes uh, we're, we're introduced to the main character, this, this, this wisdom teacher, wisdom person known as the teacher, as Colette. And when the teacher looks at the world, he observes something shocking. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 8, it says, There is something else meaningless that occurs on the earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve, and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. In chapter 7, he says, In this meaningless life of mine, I've seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. So whilst Proverbs says, generally speaking, good things happen for the righteous and bad things happen to the wicked, Ecclesiastes and Job say, actually, sometimes that doesn't happen that way. Sometimes the world doesn't actually quite function as, it, as, it, as, as we think it's meant to. We say that in the Psalms as well. We read from Psalm 73. I read from at the start of the service. And that's this psalm where the psalmists just can't get their heads around. Why well, it seems like he, this, this man trying to be righteous, is going through turmoil. And whilst the, 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 the evil seem to be rejoicing. So we read Proverbs through the context of the, the other books in the Old Testament that speak proverbial sayings. We also read it through the context of the New Testament. Because what does the Lord Jesus teach us? He says, well, actually... He was the sinless man. He did nothing wrong. And yet they crucified him. And he says, if they, if they did this to the master, then they'll do this to the followers. And so we have to accept that actually part of following Jesus may involve living a righteous life, living a life that, that should receive blessings, so to speak, but actually facing suffering and facing persecution. Now, Proverbs actually acknowledges this as well. It's the Proverbs that we don't read, the Proverbs that we skim over. But there are a bunch of these Proverbs that we'll see throughout the series, these sort of better than 
Proverbs, which, which alludes to the fact that sometimes life doesn't quite work in the same way that, 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 um, that the more famous Proverbs talk about. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 1. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. The implication of that is that if you've only got a dry crust of bread in your house of peace, then you are someone who's righteous, but you can only afford bread. Whereas apparently in this house of strife, they've got enough money to have a feast. And so even Proverbs itself, there are, there are a bunch of sayings like that that acknowledge that sometimes things don't quite work out as we think they ought. So we'll be attuned to that as we go through this series. But let's actually get into that text that was read. Wisdom and the fear of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs uh, began like this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. Uh, you can keep reading in your Bibles the, the next uh, through the verse 7 there, and it just keeps unpacking this idea of what the Proverbs are about about gaining wisdom and insight, instruction and prudence and all sorts of, of different things are, are mentioned there. So what is this wisdom that Proverbs are trying to help us attain? How will Proverbs help us gain wisdom? What is wisdom in the Bible? Now, let's go back to our three examples from the start, our our, 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 our genius, our, our kind of, you know, the person with the highest IQ, our, our philosophy professor, our ethics professor who can talk about philosophy, or the guy who can run really fast. What does wisdom in the Bible most look like? Well, obviously being the smartest person is quite helpful. In one sense, wisdom is about having extreme is about having intelligence to be able to think about the world and think how we ought to live. And yes, being the philosophy professor and having the apparent answer to all of life's mystery as you as you go through thinking about all the great thinkers have said, that, 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 that that's also partially helpful too. I mean the guy who wrote the majority of the proverbs, Solomon, we're told that he wrote three thousand proverbs. So to be sure, he was a bit like a philosophical professor if you were to spend time with Solomon. But what about this guy? It seems ridiculous that Bruce McAvaney described him as a genius for being able to run really fast. But I want to suggest in some respects, as ridiculous as this might be to say from the front, in some respects the model of what biblical wisdom looks like is this. I don't necessarily mean the pose or the, you know, the kind of, you know, the boastfulness of it. But Bolt is a genius because he did something. You see, wisdom in the Bible is always ultimately tied up in action. It's about actually living God's way. It's not just about thinking about how to live God's way. Uh, this word for wisdom in the Old Testament, it's, it, it's used to describe the ability to perform a vast array of activities. There's technical skills, artistic skills. There's wisdom to run a government, wisdom for diplomacy, wisdom in warfare, wisdom in judging the guilty, wisdom in making decisions in difficult circumstances. There's even wisdom in sailing uh, in the Old Testament. Basically, it's about the ability that enables humans to cope with life and to achieve what would otherwise be impossible. So as bizarre as it, as it might sound, it, 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 in this kind of sense, of course, intelligence is helpful. Of course, we never think about all the different viewpoints the world is helpful. But ultimately, wisdom is about the ability to act. The simplest summary, I think, for wisdom in the Bible is true wisdom is knowing how to live, God, live and act God's way in God's world. Wisdom is knowing how to live and act God's way in God's world. That's what we're trying to do as we try and live this life of wisdom. But then we get to this rather tricky verse. Uh, this verse is really the summary of the book of Proverbs. 
This is the book that the verse that the, the Proverbs keeps circling back to. This is the one that we're meant to be thinking about as we read Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is an example we'll talk about with the parallelism of Hebrew poetry. The second line is the contrast. What you're meant to do is be a person who fears the Lord. That's the beginning of knowledge. But the fool despises wisdom and knowledge. Despises wisdom and instruction. We are to not be the fool. The implication is we're meant to read through this and realise this, this, this book is, this, 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 is part of this pathway of attaining wisdom. But the fountain of the wisdom, the beginning point, the foundation of wisdom is found in the fear of the Lord. Which begs the question, what actually is the fear of the Lord? Fear of the Lord is an expression that I, I've heard Christians try and get our heads around. And frankly, I don't know if we ever really get our heads around because it, it, it's something that just seems so foreign to us. Uh, the expression itself is used something like 15 times in the book of Proverbs. You can, you can Google it later and look up all the different verse references if you, if you want. But what does fear look like? Uh, if you've been in church for any period of time, you, you, you're familiar in one sense with the concept of the fear of the Lord, but practising it is hard to understand. Because it feels weird, it feels foreign, and it feels to go against how we usually talk about our relationship with God. We use words like relationship. We speak about closeness with God, intimacy with God, love of God, and that word of fear seems to go completely against that. It also goes against our kind of Australian instincts of, of trying to have this sort of egalitarian society. We, we like to bring our leaders down to our level. And so subconsciously, I think we actually want to do that with God as well. We don't want to elevate God too much. We like to think of him as just one of us. So to get our heads around fear, I think we need to... to, to to, to try and see what the scriptures are really saying. Because in English, when we use the word fear, fear equals unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger or the threat of pain or harm. It's an emotion that more or less causes us to cower in the corner. But the word in Hebrew actually has a far wider array of meanings. And this phrase, the fear of the Lord, is a, is a combination of this wide array of meanings. Uh, the basic meaning of the word is the one we're used to. The basic meaning of fear in, in, in the Hebrew Bible is dread or terror. It's the feeling of understanding the incredible power and the incredible holiness of God and how weak and sinful we are. And it ought to engender that response in the sense of cowering in a corner. That's part of the equation. But you've got to remember there are other meanings tied up with it. Because it also means to stand in awe of someone. And so in the case of God, it's about being in the awe of God's majesty and his holiness and his radiance and his wisdom and his grace and even his love. And yes, the word is also tied up in those other concepts that sometimes he's spoken of, of respect and revere. And so when you put this sort of, this array of memes together, I think one of the, the, the best definitions I've heard of is one that you, you kind of have to switch your brain on for a moment to, to follow. But it really captures what this, this phrase is trying to get at. The fear of the Lord is an expression that it captures... The polar opposites. So the fear of the Lord is an expression that captures the polar opposites of shrinking back in fear and drawing close in awe and adoration. That's what you're trying to get in your head when you read this phrase, the fear of the Lord. It is somehow the polar opposite emotions and, and, and feelings of, of shrinking back in fear and drawing close in awe and in adoration of God. Now that that, that, that that still may not sit that comfortably with us when we, when we think, but I love God, and I love spending time with God. I couldn't possibly ever start fearing. Fearing is negative. You don't have a good relationship with someone that you, that you fear. 
I think there are, there are plenty of verses in the scriptures that help us see this. One of the interesting things you see in Deuteronomy in chapter, to, to, to chapter uh, uh, 5 and 6 is, is so often that the word for heart and love is attached to the word with fear. In Isaiah chapter 11, that one of those passages that talks about the coming of the Messiah, it says the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And you see, I was trying to bring out this idea of, of, of shrinking back, but also awe, adoration, love, delight. They are these polar opposites that somehow attract. And so often for, 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 for people, we, we, we have one of these things, but we don't actually have understand both of these things and, 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 and let that sort of those polar opposites attract and, and bring us together. Some people, they fear the Lord. They, they, they have this sense of the, the holiness of God. They realise that he is this creator. He is the consuming fire. And so they, 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 they don't want anything to do with him. I have people who tell me, I, I don't really want to, I, I, I genuinely have people say, oh, I don't really want to come to church because I fear what might happen. Maybe the roof will fall in. Maybe lightning will strike because I am so unholy. But then the more common thing amongst Christians is to not even think about fear, not even to think in terms of, of this sort of reverent awe towards God, but just to think of him as the, my best friend, to think of him as the one who, who, who I couldn't possibly ever have any, any discomfort around. And in one sense that's fine, but... If it then means, well, I don't really care about holiness, I don't really care about trying to live his way because I don't necessarily, well, that closeness doesn't reflect in realising that God is a holy God and desires me to live his way, then we've missed something. But what's meant to happen is these, these, these so-called polar opposites are meant to attract and if we have this right fear for God, understanding that he is this holy other and yet he is the one who sent his son. He is the one who hung upon a cross. He is the one that expressed the ultimate love for us. Then they should actually attract and bind us to him and, 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 and instill in us this, 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 this heartfelt desire to want to honour him, to want to awe him, and want to be with this God and live his way. That's what these polar opposites of the fear of the Lord are meant to do. Uh, just about every preacher has quoted this story, and I'm sure I have before, but it, it, the, the story of, of C.S. Lewis and, and the Narnia, you know, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, 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 and when the children first enter into Narnia and they, and they meet Mr. Beaver, and he starts talking about Aslan. And Aslan, you know, he's the lion in, in the Narnia books. He is the, the, the representative figure of Christ. And the children, Mr. Beaver keeps talking about Aslan and, and, and talking about he is this lion, he is this mighty being. And, 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 the, and the children, they, they kind of get worried about it. And, and they find themselves uh, asking, well, hang on, is it safe to be near Aslan? Should we actually be trying to journey towards him? And Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. C.S. Lewis is trying to bring out. It's, it's not, God isn't safe in that sense. He is, this, he is this consuming fire that Hebrews talks about. But he is good. And you want to be near him. Oswald Chambers quite fantastically sums up the effects the fear of the Lord ought to have on us. He says, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. When you fear God, you fear nothing else. If you don't fear God, you fear everything else. Friends, that's one of the, 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 the simplest summaries of what it's meant to look like. And it's one of the ones we struggle with most. It doesn't matter if you're at school and you find yourself in this situation, it's so easy for you to try and fit in. And you want to fit in with all your friends and your friends have a way they want to live. And, and even in environments like a Christian school, you realise pretty quickly that being a Christian 
is a minority even there. It's a significant minority compared to in the state system, but you are a minority. So who do you fear more? Do you fear the opinion of your friends and what they want you to end up doing? Or do you fear God? Because fearing God will mean that actually you're not that concerned ultimately about what, you still want to be a friend, but you're more worried about God. It means that you'll actually be willing to, to say, hey, you want to come along with me to youth group? Come along with me to church. And, 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 and if they reject you, so what? Because you fear God, not them. Now, the adults in the room know that, that we don't have that issue anymore because we've got free school and we never fear people anymore. If only that were true. We still find ourselves in so many different situations where we find ourselves caving in to fearing what other people may think about us, whether it be people in our families or our workplaces or our sports teams or whatever it might be. But when we fear God, we fear nothing else. And we decide to live with wisdom and live his way and we don't really worry what other people will ultimately then think about us. You see, ultimately, to be able to do this, we need humility to realise that we actually need God's wisdom in our life. Uh, there's another C.S. Lewis quote that I'm going to steal because he just is a better thinker than pretty much anyone else that ever lives. And he sums up the whole idea of, 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 of God and wisdom like this. He says, In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Christian life is about realising that following Christ means that we are following someone who is immeasurably superior to ourselves. Someone who has wisdom that we just don't have. And it's about having the humility to realise that we need to ask for help. James tells us, if any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But to be able to do that asking, we need to have the humility to realise that we don't actually know it all. But we also have to have the confidence that our God will surely respond and give us wisdom. And so, friends, my prayer in this series is that this would be a series that we can be thinking through wisdom and thinking through how to live God's way in God's world and we can be people that are continually asking God for the help to be able to live his way and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are this almighty God. We thank you that you are uh, this God of love but also this God of who is this consuming fire. And so help us not shrink back or help us not just be close and not realising we should shrink, but help us fear you. Help us be both people who shrink back but also draw near, who acknowledge your power, who acknowledge your holiness, who acknowledge your awe-inspiring goodness and seek to live your way in your world for your glory. Please give us the wisdom to do so, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.